over that span, over the tallest mountains. And it's been one of those greatest challenges. And I don't know if you've ever spoken to people who do climbing and mountain climbing and various things like that, but they often start on lower peaks working their way up. And they have to often acclimatise themselves because the, uh, the height is so great, the air is so thin, and even just walking and standing is, is hard work because the air is so thin up there. And people work their way up, and as a, as a race, as a, as, a, as a people group, as humanity that we are, we're always trying to push the boundaries. We're always trying to a little bit further, a little bit deeper, push it a little bit harder. You know, people said, we no one would get, we'd be able to get into space. And now we're sending probes right into the far, far, uh, galaxies even to, to places like Mars. I know there are various road uh, <laughs> machines, rovers that go around Mars and send back pictures to us. And so we're always looking further and deeper and trying to accomplish more with our life. And it was, as I was thinking about it, I was reminded of the, the story in Genesis 11. So if you turn with me to Genesis 11, if you've got it. And it says this. And some of you might have thought this was a bit of a fairy tale, but this is a, this is a true life account of what happened. This is early in our history of our world and of our, of our race. And it says this, now the whole earth had one language and the same words. And as people migrated from the east, they found a plain in the land of Shinar and settled there. And they said to one another, come, let us make bricks and burn them thoroughly. And they had brick for stone and bitumen for water. Then they said, Come, let us build ourselves a city and a town with its top in the heavens, and let us make a name for ourselves, lest we be dispersed over the face of the whole, of the whole earth. So they're trying to make this kind of town run their way up towards God. They're trying to make a, a name for themselves so they will be remembered. Trying to make a, you know, achieve something great within their lifetime. And the Lord came down to see the city and the tower with which the children had built. And the Lord said, they are one people, and they have all one language. And this is only the beginning of what they will do. And nothing that they propose to do will now be impossible for them. Come and go down and there and confuse their language, so that they may not understand one another's speech. So the Lord dispersed them from there, over the face of the earth. And they left off building the city. Therefore his name was called Babel, Babel, because there the Lord confused the language of all the earth. And from there the Lord dispersed them over the face of the earth. And then the story goes on and the nation after nation spreads across the, the world in which they knew at the time. That story I find quite incredible because, as I said, man is trying to make their way to God. They're trying to accomplish something incredible in their lifetime. They're trying to make a name for themselves. And so they start to build this tower, trying to work their way towards God. But God's there looking, and I'm not saying heaven's up there and earth's down there, but we kind of get this picture. That God is looking down from his realm. And that he's looking into this earthly realm. And that the people are trying to make their way to him. And he's looking at them and saying, look, you can never make your way to me. That in fact, God had to come down to the people. That God had to come down to where they were. Because they were never going to be able to make it up to where he is. It didn't matter how many bricks they put together. It didn't matter how hard they tried. It didn't matter if they worked day and night. They were never going to make their way into the presence of the realm, into the place of heaven where God is. There was just too big a void, too big a gap. And that God has to come and meet with them. And all the way through the Bible, we see this picture. That people are trying to make their way to God. That people are trying to get into this place of presence. They're trying to discover who this God is. And they might be running after all kinds of different things, different types of gods, different types of desires, different types of passions, and they're trying to make their way into this place that they call heaven, and then they're never actually ever achieving it, that they never can quite get there. The whole Jewish sacrificial system is there to tell us this, that the Jews, that they started to sacrifice animals, they put burnt offerings on stones, and on bricks, and on wooden piles, they would burn them in as a, a sacrifice to say, God, we've messed up, you've gone wrong, we can't get close to you because you're too great, you're too holy, you're too perfect. And so what we do is we're trying to take something and we'll offer it up to you in the hope that we might please you, in the hope that we might be able to get close to you, in the hope that we might be able to take you from where we are and stuck in the, the depths and the sins of our life and our world and get into a better place. And then they're constantly looking to try and get into this better place. And all throughout history this becomes more elaborate and more grand and more complicated. 
so much so that the, that the Israelites, God, people, God's people built this temple, the most incredible complex temple in which they were to house the Ten Commandments, which they thought was the presence of God. That the, the Ark of the Covenant was going to sit there with the cherubim sitting on top of it. And it was to be placed into the Holy of Holies. It was to be placed into this area where no one was to go, where, where God was untouchable, and that they would be able to somehow try and make some sacrifices that would enable them to get closer and closer and closer. And depending on what sacrifices you made, depending on how close you could actually get. And some people were way outside the, the walls of this complex. Other people were a little bit further in. Some people got in a little bit further in still. And they had to sacrifice. They had to try and make their way in. But no one could ever really get there. And only once a year could one priest go in to make the very final sacrifice on the altar in the presence of the Most Holy God, fearing for his life that he may be struck down dead because this God is a whole consuming fire. And the whole of the Bible talks to us about this God who is so holy, that is so perfect, that is so untouchable, out beyond our reach, and that we're trying to make our way towards him. And those are the people that don't even believe in God are somehow trying to make their way towards him. They're trying to discover the universe, trying to discover more science, trying to discover uh, unknown planets and cosmoses, trying to discover the depths of the world that we're trying to live in, trying to get closer to God and they don't they even realise it. Here the Bible tells us that, that he's untouchable, that he can, we cannot get close to him because he needs to come close to us. And we've been looking at the Christmas story you know, over the last few weeks and, and thinking about Jesus coming and his God coming and thinking about that, that the no way can anyone get to God and yet God comes down to us in the form of a child. That he puts on humanity, he puts on flesh for us because he wants us to know. Because he wants us to be able to step right in to that holy place, to his presence. Tell me to the book of Revelation. It's just it's such an incredible passage, Revelation 4. And John, so Jesus has come, he's grown up, he's died on the cross, he's defeated saints and death, he's risen to new life. The church has been birthed, it is spreading across the known world. And John is in prison in this island of Patmos. And he's stuck there, he's been born alive, or when he's still alive somehow, disfigured, maimed, still preaching the Jesus message. And he's there, and suddenly he's taken into this another dimension, this, this other realm of heaven. Chapter 4, verse 1. After this, I looked, this is John speaking, and I saw the door standing open in heaven. And the first verse which I heard speaking to me like a trumpet said, Come up here. Okay. Do you see the contrast? So they're trying to make their way up through the Tower of Babel. They're trying to make their way into the presence of the sacrifice. And yet they can't get there. But Jesus has now come. He has made the final sacrifice. The curtain has been torn in two to separate us from God. The sin that was in the way, the barrier, the void that was there has been wrenched, has been parted, has been made. A way for us to get through and get over into the presence of God. So no longer does God have to say, I'll come down to you. But he says to us, come up here to me. I want you to see that. If you're not a Christian here today, or if you are a Christian here today, the life of following Jesus isn't pulling God down to where we are, but it's us stepping up to where he is. It's us stepping into that place, that realm, that supernatural world of God we call heaven, and to sit with him in his place, where he is, where he speaks, where he is king above all kings. And so John is there in the presence of God, and he calls him back up into heaven and says, Come up here, and I will show you what must take place after this. And for some people, we have, so some people I speak to find it very difficult to know where their life is going. Some people, you may be here today, you're not sure what the future holds, that you may find it very difficult to plan, and you don't really know where life's turns are going to take you. You might be not be sure what you've been called to, or what God's given you to, to do for your life. You may be not sure what, what job you need to do next, what school you need to do, what 
subjects he's designed. John Hughes' story John speaks is about how we can actually find out what God wants from us. And it's not us just sitting there saying, God, show me. It's us going, okay, I'm going to come up and you are. Because where you are, you need to show us everything that you have. Because he says, come up here and I will show you what must take place after this. It's in God's presence. It's in that spiritual place with God as we step up into heaven that we begin to see the plans that God has for us. We begin to see the purposes He has for us. We begin to see the significance that He's placed upon our lives. We begin to see, even though we may not know right away to the future, everything that God has for us. We begin to see that there is a way forward. That there is light at the end of the tunnel. That there is hope in our lives. That we can get through whatever it is that we're getting through. And that we will go on to greater things. That God will show us in that place everything that we need to know and everything that we need to see. John writes that at once I was in the Spirit. And I want you to, as you read this, to know that this is for you. That just like John, you can be in the Spirit with God. That you can sit right into the spiritual realm. Right into the place of God. That you can fly in a place with God where you are above everything else and you begin to see the wealth of what it is. And once I was in the Spirit, and behold, a throne stood in heaven, and with one seated on the throne. And he who sat there had the appearance of Jasper and Carnelian. And around the throne was a rainbow that had the appearance of an emerald. Around the throne were 24 thrones, and seated on their thrones were 24 elders, clothed in white garments with golden crowns on their heads. And from the throne came flashes of lightning and rumblings, and peals of thunder, and before the throne were burning seven torches of fire, which are the seven spirits of God. And before the throne there was, as it were, a sea of glass like crystal. John writes this to show us where we are to be seated. He writes this to show us as Christians where our life should be placed. And our life is not to be placed on this earth, being bound by everything that it throws at us. Get so caught up in the work and everything I've got to do. Get caught up in the decisions that I've got to make. Get caught up in, in the financial pressures or the, the pressures in which the world comes around us. It's, John shows us that we are not to be so earthly bound that we are weighed down by everything that this material world wants to throw at us. But he shows us it, that there is a place that we sit in heaven, free from that, where we soar far above the pressures and the pains of this world, where we can look down and see it from God's perspective rather than ours. And God is calling us to be a church that begins to look and live and sit and work from heaven. You might be thinking, what on earth are you talking about that? Which sounds a bit like my way jumping. But this is what we've been called to. Ephesians 2. Paul writes to the church in Ephesus and he says that we have been seated in heavenly places with Christ Jesus. Far above all rule and all power. That we have been seated in heavenly places with Christ Jesus. Above everything else that tries to drain us down. That we are seated in heavenly places with Christ Jesus on thrones where we are ruling with him. Now this is not a future desire or a future want, but this is a present reality. That if you are here today and you have given your life to Jesus, you are now seated. And you might be saying, I'm seated in the sports center today. I'm seated on my seat here on this lovely hall. And I'm, I'm kind of just, you know, what are you talking about? No, you are physically seated here where you are spiritually seated. Your spirit, your, your very essence of who you are, the, the very makeup of the fabric of your being is placed in heaven. As soon as you receive Jesus Christ, your spirit is united with his. You were pulled into heaven. You were pulled into your eternal destiny. You were placed on a, on a throne. You were given a crown in heaven because you were there to be placed to rule with authority in this earth. Thank you. You have been given authority to rule on this earth. Church, the church is so slow in picking this up that we just kind of go through our life and we just do things that we can do and we kind of get involved in nice little services, this, doing this, doing that. And yet we've been called into a place of authority where we can literally declare the reality of heaven onto this earth. And the earth has to begin to mold to heaven. 
that we have been given such a privileged position. And you know what? Whether you believe in Jesus or not, Jesus gave his life so you can have that position. You may have not received him yet, but he gave your life, his life for you so that you can know him today. And I'm not talking about dying and going into this fluffy cloud of heaven where we've got fat babies playing harps. I'm talking about heaven being here now on earth. I'm talking about your life making a difference today. I'm talking about that Jesus has given you everything that you need. And he holds nothing back. I want you to know that there's a God, this God holds nothing back from you. And you might say that today I've, I've struggled with this illness for so long. Or you don't understand the financial pressures that I'm under. Yet he still, I would say to you, has given you everything. And you are, and you are, whether you realize or not, sitting in heaven. Ephesians 2, that we are seated in heavenly places with Christ Jesus. That we are seated with Jesus, God of the universe. Because he wants us so passionate to live in his love. One of the things God has been so talking to me about. And I was thinking about my New Year's resolutions and the kind of packs that we make, and, you know, the elusive sitting and start running together and all these good things. And you know what? I just, so I was sitting in my kitchen last night and I was listening to this song. I just said, to Jesus, what I want to know is your love. Jesus, what I want to know is your love. So that I can love. Do you know what? That would be the greatest resolution you can ever make. To say, Jesus, Jesus, I give time to you so I can experience the depths, the oceans, the magnitude of love. So I can love God. And you know what? It's that place. It's seated in heavenly places that we begin to see the love that is emanating. From this God who is done. Everything about it, from the poor, you cut in half, everything is love. And whatever bad stuff you've gone through, and whatever trials you're facing, and whatever difficulties you've come across, I want you to know that it doesn't change the fact that God loves. He loves passion. And He's calling us into that place where we can just experience it. And you might say, Yeah, but I'm a God, and I kind of don't need a rough, tough, you know. I don't even need quiche. You need to know God's love for all the Especially for daily quiche. It doesn't matter how tough you are, how sorted you are, how, how big you think you are, how together you think you've got it. You need God's love. I encourage you today, church, as we finish 2014, we're about to step into 2015. In 2003, God's been gracious to us. I've been blown away by what we've been doing and how it's just been blown out of love. And the, we have seen so many people say that this year, so many miracles take place. But I'm just blown away by the God of it. We're talking about is calling us to this place of radical love. Not that we just love radical love, but that we experience it is radical love. And I want you to know that it's not selfish of you, and it's not bad of you just to spend time in God's presence and allow Him to pull that love into your heart. Because that's the place you and I need to be. And we need to live from that place in heaven, where we sit next to God himself. Our spirits are there. And we just allow his life to pull into ours. And you know the incredible thing is, as we do that, the stuff of this world begins to look a little bit different. The pressures and the problems that were plaguing us seem to just not hold the weight they did and bring what they had before. We're just able to walk a little bit lighter, a little bit stronger, a little bit further. I love it from Isaiah where it says, Even young men will grow weary. They will, they will become faint, they will lose strength. But it says, Those who wait upon the Lord, those that sit in the place of heaven, those that are now in the privilege of Jesus Christ, are seated in heavenly places. Those that wait upon the Lord will renew their strength. That your strength will be renewed. 
I know what it's like to just have nothing, to just be spent. And yet God says, just in that place, if you just give time to him, let him renew you. Not only will he renew you, but he will allow you to soar and fly above everything else. That you will rise up on wings like eagles. That you will run and will not grow weary. And you will just be able to go forward and not even feel faint because God will hold, hold you and take you forward. And as we need to come up just for a moment, she's been, God's been speaking to her about something I just wanted to share. Uh, I had this phone this morning, so she's really just going to share what God's got on her life. Fits in, I think, a little bit what we're talking about today. Right. Um, I really didn't know that this, so. Um, can I just encourage you, one thing that Dave said about, um, uh, about that we're seated in heavenly places and we can see what the Father does. It says in the word that Jesus only did what he saw the Father do, not what he heard, and I know that it's absolutely fine to hear the book, but therefore we are to be, uh, if made, we're made in the image of Christ, we're to be more like him, so therefore we see what God does. Yeah, so we walk in what he shows us, okay, as well as what we hear, how that sense. Um, a couple of things which, um, can I just say the Bible's awesome, getting into the Bible. Um, it's great to read books, but it's, the Bible is awesome. And I've been, uh, it's been taking, can I just say, later there's a Wikipedia little trail sometimes to pick up on something and go around Wikipedia. I do that with the Bible, I pick up on something and then I find I go to different places. A couple of things that he's been speaking to me about is in Micah, and it kind of ties in with the mountain, the mountain I think, so. If you want to turn to Micah chapter 4, excuse me. Um, this is about the mountain of the Lord. And it says this, It shall come to pass in the latter days that the mountain of the house of the Lord shall be established as the highest of the mountains, and it shall be lifted up above the hills, and people shall flow to it. I just want to stop there. Because I think that's a little bit weird that people should flow to it. So I did a bit of an investigation on the word flow. And the flow obviously links to you. Obviously links to rivers. Um, but I also thought, well, what does flow actually mean? And so I, I looked at it in Wikipedia. Wikipedia is the word. But one, there's lots of different definitions of the flow, of the word flow. Um, but it does say the hallmark of flow is a feeling of spontaneous joy. Now this is the word, the world's view of the flow. Okay. And it is the feeling of spontaneous joy, even rapture while performing a task. And it's a focus on something, you know, when you say I'm in the flow of things. So I was thinking that's a bizarre in the Bible to have this word, that people should flow to it. So it seems to me that the mountain of the Lord is where we need to go. We need to be high and lifted up. And we are seated in heavenly places. So it's all to do with the flow. It's all, all to do with making sure that we step into that river. And we, during the prayer week that we had, that was a theme that kind of came out was the river in Ezekiel uh, 47 and how we step into the river. And uh, we certainly had it in the ladies weekend as well. But then it says, Come, let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the Lord of Jacob, that he may teach us his ways. <coughs> so we learn from God. We learn from David. David learns from God. We learn from God. For out of Zion shall go forth the law, and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. He shall judge between many peoples, and shall decide the strong nations far away. And they shall beat their swords into plowshares, and their spears into pruning their nation. Nation shall not lift up sword against nation, neither shall they learn war anymore. But they shall sit every man under his vine and under his fig tree, and no one shall make them afraid, for the mouth of the Lord of hosts is spoken. And then I got thinking about the whole thing to do with figs and vines, and I thought that was an interesting thing, that they shall not learn war anymore. So in the latter days they shall not learn war anymore. So but we shall sit under fig trees and vines. And so fig trees and vines are a key thing. And if you are as so we go to it, but in Zechariah chapter three, it talks about again that we shall bring people in to sit under our fig tree and vines. So this is the house of the Lord, okay, and we sit under fig trees and vines because we are protected by our God, okay, and we can bring people in and sit underneath. 
And then there's another bit in Kings um, where they, I have to go to the number it fully, there's another bit in Kings where they talk about fig trees and vines. It's really interesting, fig trees and vines and things that grow. The fig tree is a really big tree. Okay, I have a picture of it, but it's a huge tree. And I just, my heart is that you learn to sit under his fig tree and under his vine. And that you just, just come into that place and you see the thing. You know, the word is exciting. Okay, uh, what I do is I, this might sound a bit crazy, but I, I, I invite Jesus to come and sit next to me when I read the word. I actually create space for him. And I say, can I sit down and show you what you want me to see? And show me he takes me on a massive journey around the world. And it really will just blow your mind when you start realising how all the Bible links together what it means. You know, and yeah, come up here. There's a song by Jason Octa, which is called Come Up Here. If you ever, if you, I won't read out with words or anything, but it's come up here, come like the mind. Um, and it says about flying as well. And uh, I don't think there's any surprise at all in, in the word where it has things like eagles, where it has mountains. You know, it's, it's talking about how we can come up here. And that says it in the Old Testament and in the New Testament as well. And this is the whole thing, the consistency between the Old Testament and the New Testament. Come up here and fly. to do that because God is stirring something in our heart and God is stirring in our hearts. And it's this, that he's calling us into that place. He's calling us not to, it's to realise that we are there. It's not that we have to make our way there. It's not that we have to do anything or achieve anything. It's not that we've got to make sacrifices anymore. It's not that we've got to be super spiritual, super pious. It's not that we've got to be super, super, super solid Christians. It's saying, do you not realise that you are already there? aware of the surroundings of heaven around you. But God is saying that we've been born into heaven places. That we are up on that mountain today. The psalmist writes, who can ascend the hill? Who can come into that holy place? He's desiring, he's looking for a time when people can be brought into that place. And through Jesus, we are now there. And as many have said, the important thing is that not only will we hear God's voice, but I don't know about you, that when I speak to my kids sometimes, I go, what? Can you go and pick socks and what? Can you, can you come and get shoes or what? But if they come in front of them, you go, here's your shoes, put them on, and they see it, they do something with it. And that's the difference between just hearing God and, and, and also seeing you. But God wants us to see everything that He has for us, not just hear it. Because when we hear it, we miss it. But when we see it, it's very plain and clear. And this is what John sees. As I bring this to an end, around the throne, on each side of the throne, are four living creatures, full of eyes in front and behind. The first living creature like a lion, the second like an ox, the third with the face of a man, the fourth living creature like an eagle in flight. And the four living creatures, each of them with six wings, are full of eyes all around. And within a day and night, they never cease saying, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, who was and is, and is to come. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. And whenever the living creatures give glory and honour and thanks to him, who we see on the throne, who lives forever and ever, the 24 elders fall down before him, who we see on the throne, and they worship him, who lives forever and ever, and they cast their crowns before the throne, saying, Worthy are you, O Lord and God, to receive glory and honour and power. For you created, you created all things, and by your will they exist and were created. The, the joy is coming into this place and everywhere he sees that the whole of this universe and multiverses around us are only in existence because of God and only remain in existence because of him. That he holds it together through his might and through his power and through his goodness. Out of his creativity flowed this universe and you and I, and out of his love he continues to hold it together. And John is pulled into that place where he realises, yes, he's there on Panos, yes, he is in prison, yes, he's been tortured, and yes, he's about to die very soon. 
And yet, he realizes that actually, his greater reality is heaven, where he is in the presence of God Almighty and the angels. And every spiritual and living being, where he finds rest and refuge from the world, where he finds strength and everything that he needs, where he begins to see what his destiny is about, and is not confined by his world. He sees this later on in Revelation 7, verse 15. Therefore, he's talking about the saints. They are before the throne of God, and they serve him day and night in his temple. And he who sits on the throne will shelter them with his presence. And he was talking about the fig tree. And the fig tree represents this place of refuge, this place of, of rest, this place where we can just eat and be at peace. And John sees this. And he says that in the presence of God we have complete shelter, we have complete wholeness, we have complete peace. It says in verse 16, that they shall hunger no more, neither thirst anymore. The sun shall not strike them, nor the scorching heat, for the Lamb in the midst of the throne will be their shepherd. And he will guide them to springs of living water, and God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. That this is a reality for us today. And I want you to see that this isn't just about death, but I want you to see this is about life today. And the reality of heaven is that he meets us where we are. The reality of heaven is that when we are dry, when we are struggling, when we are just limping through life, that we can sit in that place with God. And that we can know his love, that we can know his provision, we can know his protection, we can know his peace. For those of us that are looking for pleasure, for, for desires, for looking to fulfill something inside us, an empty void, a hole somewhere, that we've tried everything, we've given everything. This teaches us and tells us that the only place where we are fully satisfied is in the presence of God. That it's only there when we realize where we are, where we are seated, how much Jesus has given, what he has done, that we actually find contentment. You know, why is it that we just want so much more because we don't realize what we already have? And I want us to see today, that as we go through to 2014, and maybe you've got some New Year's resolutions that you want to make, some things you want to stop doing, or things you want to start doing. My heart is that as a church, whatever we come on, whatever crazy projects God gets us up to, whatever crazy things He asks of us that weigh on our ability, I don't want it to be focused. I want to I want Jesus to be the focus. I want our position in the throne room, the very holy presence of God, to be our place where we rest, where we live, where we serve, where we live, where we work. I want that to be the very central, motivating position of our lives. Because I tell you, church, that when we do that, when we do that, we will realize that the good shepherd comes nothing back from his sheep. The Lord's my shepherd, I shall not want it. The Lord is my shepherd, I won't have any need, any lack, any fear. Because the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want it. Just take a moment to meditate, to, to think about, to meditate means just to think about, to do a Christian way. Just to think about what it is that God is wanting to show us today. Just take a moment to close your eyes, that sometimes helps with the distractions. And I just want you to know, if you're Jesus is here today, if you're not you, you can give your life to him. He's given his life for you. You've just got to say thank you, Jesus. Nothing else. The sins have been dealt with on the cross. It doesn't matter what you've done, it's all been dealt with. You've just got to say yes, Jesus. And I want you to know that when we said yes to Jesus, there we are. Here. And there we are seated in heaven. Just 
close your eyes. Just, just take a moment, even here now in church, which I know we don't do, just to listen and to look and see what he shows you. He's got things that he wants to show each of us here today. He's got things that he wants to reveal to us. Revelation is just to open up our eyes about to see something. As we just quiet, the Holy Spirit is going to speak and change things that are significant to you. So Lord, we just thank you for that. And we just wait and we look and this.